Welcome to Military Analytics. With the Russian Army's invasion of Ukrainian territory, a new round of sanctions and embargoes has been imposed on Russia. Vladimir Putin is furious after the latest sanctions against Russia. Hundreds of thousands of Russian citizens are being deported from Kazakhstan. The kilometer-long queue at the border between Kazakhstan and Russia stunned everyone. In 1991, Kazakhstan declared its independence and decided to separate from Soviet Russia. Kazakhstan's relations with Russia have been quite problematic lately. In the first months of the war, Kazakh President Kasim Jamart Tokayev, who remained unresponsive to the Russian army's invasion of Ukrainian territory, was subjected to criticism from the U.S. and Western countries. After U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin's allegations that Kazakhstan was providing military support to Russia, the president of Kazakhstan denied these allegations. Shortly after this incident, Kazakhstan's financial support to Ukraine angered Russian leader Vladimir Putin, threatening the Kazakhstan government. Russian leader Vladimir Putin led to the deportation of Russian citizens living in Kazakhstan. After this tension between Russia and Kazakhstan, Kazakh leader Tokayev started to deport Russian citizens living in Kazakhstan with their decision. The Kazakhstan government, which tried to keep good relations with both Ukraine and Russia by following a neutral policy in the first months of the war, could not withstand the pressure of the USA and Western countries and decided to send support to Ukraine. Kazakhstan President Kasim Jamart Tokayev stated that they would provide a large financial support to Ukraine. Kazakhstan provided Ukraine with a large number of ambulance, medicines, and food, as well as a large amount of money. In response to Kazakhstan's support for Ukraine, Russian leader Vladimir Putin openly threatened Kazakh President Tokayev. As it is known, there is a gas union agreement between Russia, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan. Vladimir Putin stated in a statement that Kazakhstan should be excluded from this gas union agreement. Afterwards, he called on Russian billionaires operating in Kazakhstan to stop natural gas production facilities in Kazakhstan. Addressing Russian businessmen, Putin tried to undermine Kazakhstan's energy exports by stating that all Russian businessmen who decided to stop their activities in Kazakhstan would be provided with resources in Russia. Kazakhstan, a country rich in energy, derives most of its income from energy exports. President Tokayev, who did not want to bow to these threats of Vladimir Putin, started a study to deport more than 100,000 Russian citizens living in Kazakhstan in response to Putin. Tokayev, who activated Kazakhstan security forces, sent notices to each of the houses where Russian citizens live. If we come to the details of the news after the tensions between Russia and Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan's decision to deport Russian citizens in response to Vladimir Putin caused great turmoil in Kazakhstan. Tens of thousands of Russian citizens took to the streets to protest against the Kazakhstan government. Kazakhstan's interior minister, Kasimov, tried to prevent these protests by involving Kazakhstan's security forces. Following the decision to deport Russian citizens in Kazakhstan, Russian government officials opened the border gates with Kazakhstan and called on Russian citizens to return to Russia. Russian citizens who already knew that they would be deported started to leave the territory of Kazakhstan. Russian citizens who did not want to go started to be removed from the border with the intervention of Kazakhstan security forces. The kilometer-long queue formed in Mamluk City on the Russian border of Kazakhstan fell like a bomb in the world press. Tens of thousands of Russian citizens are trying to leave the country and return to Russian territory. This decision taken by Kazakhstan caused Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov to go crazy. Minister Lavrov, who made a statement on this issue, promised that citizens returning to Russia would not have housing problems and that the necessary assistance would be provided to these citizens. After this decision taken by Kazakhstan, Kazakh authorities who decided to take precautions against the possibility of an attack by Russia against Kazakhstan started to send troops to the Russian border. Kazakh soldiers who started to be sent to the Russian border with a large number of armored vehicles are trying to ensure border security by establishing headquarters in these regions. At the same time, it is claimed that Kazakh leader Tokayev wants to meet with U.S. President Joe Biden. However, according to experts, Russia does not have the power to enter a new war at the moment. For this reason, it is said that any intervention by Russia in Kazakhstan is out of the question. While millions of Russian citizens are trying to leave Russia with the start of the war, with this decision taken by Kazakhstan, more than 100,000 Russian citizens are being sent back to Russian territory. 
With the partial mobilization decision previously taken by Russian leader Vladimir Putin, many Russian citizens started to leave the country, realizing that they would be possibly recruited by Putin into the Russian army and forced to fight in Ukraine. Russian citizens began to leave their own lands. The majority of Russian citizens who left the country migrated to Kazakhstan. Now, with this decision, the majority of Russian citizens who migrated to Kazakhstan are being sent back. In fact, there are positive aspects to this event for Vladimir Putin. With the return of the Russian citizens who left the country, Putin will be able to re-enlist those who were included in the mobilization decision. This will give Putin more Russian soldiers to fight on Ukrainian soil. Russian General Valery Gerasimov is very worried because the Russian army has recently suffered a lot of casualties on Ukrainian soil. The Russian government, which continues to work to find new soldiers for the Russian army, has set up volunteer stands in many Russian cities. Putin, who has been cooperating with the Wagner Mercenary Company since the beginning of the war, has sent many mercenaries to Ukrainian territory. However, after a while, this number of soldiers became insufficient. Putin, who wanted to accelerate his occupation of Ukrainian territory by finding more soldiers, first started sending prisoners from Russian prisons to fight in Ukraine by recruiting them into the army through the Wagner Mercenary Company. Many Russian prisoners joined the Wagner unit and started fighting for Russia in exchange for their freedom. Not only that, Putin demanded that the Wagner Company withdraw its troops stationed abroad and send them to Ukraine. At the same time, it was decided to withdraw the troops from the Russian headquarters in Syria. Thousands of Russian soldiers were to be sent from Syria to Ukraine, but Putin's decision was not well received by Russian soldiers in Syria. Russian soldiers who were living a comfortable life in Syria were aware that they would find themselves in the middle of a big war in Ukraine. Not wanting to lose their comfortable lives, Russian soldiers initially refused to go to Ukraine. However, after Putin decided to close the Russian headquarters there, these soldiers were forced to go to Ukrainian territory. The fact that the majority of the soldiers included in the army with Vladimir Putin's decision of partial mobilization were minority soldiers came to the agenda again with the inclusion of minority citizens living in the autonomous republics in Russia. The public started to react to this. The fact that nearly 200,000 of the 300,000 Russian soldiers included in the army with the mobilization decision were chosen for minority citizens made the minority people very angry. Minority citizens who wanted to react to Vladimir Putin took to the streets and organized many protests against Putin and the war. These protests, which were organized mainly in regions such as Chechnya, Crimea, and Dagestan, were quickly ended as a result of Putin's pressure. Putin, who keeps the Russian security forces in constant readiness, does not allow any protests to be organized within the borders of Russia, fearing a popular uprising. Putin is aware that a new uprising would shake his authority too much. We would not be wrong if we say that one of the things Vladimir Putin fears the most is his own people. The world has proven very well to date that it's bigger than Russia. The efforts of the West and other allies of Kiev are behind factors such as the prolongation of the war in Ukraine, the Russian military getting bogged down on Ukrainian soil, and Moscow's failure to provide the necessary economic support to wage the war. Allies of the Kiev administration, which are the US, UK, and EU countries, target Moscow with economic sanctions in order to alienate Russia from this war and to enable Ukraine to win the war. The total number of sanctions imposed on Russia since the pre-war has reached 14,022. Thus, Russia left Iran, Syria, and North Korea behind and became the most sanctioned country in the world. The United Kingdom, the United States, and the European Union have issued various sanctions in the last 15 months to undermine Russia and its attempt to conquer territory in Ukraine. The United Kingdom, which has accelerated its sanctions decisions in recent days, has imposed 1,429 sanctions on Moscow so far. Vladimir Putin demanded that the United Kingdom and its allies lift sanctions against Russia without any conditions, as the economic restrictions imposed on the embattled country began to bite. According to the House of Commons Library, 1,604 individuals and to 28 organizations are subject to UK sanctions under the Russian regime. That's why Vladimir Putin got bogged down in Ukraine in terms of economic resources. But in addition to all this, the United Kingdom recently announced a new package of sanctions against Russia. 
The UK targeted 130 Russian oligarchs with a net worth of $173 billion. The United Kingdom's largest package of sanctions came as a shock to the Kremlin. The UK was officially determined to pull the plug on Russia economically after the sanctions announced by the UK. The Russian authorities made a statement directly. So as you can see, this new UK sanction has already annoyed Russia. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov told reporters that the UK and other countries that imposed sanctions on Russian assets must resolve them immediately without any conditions. In fact, before the new sanctions package of the United Kingdom, the task force of Russian elites, proxies, and oligarchs consisting of major global powers such as the USA, UK, and Germany announced that they would double their efforts to make the Russian president. Repo is a collaborative organization between the USA, Australia, Canada, Germany, Italy, France, Japan, the United Kingdom, and the European Commission, and was established in 2022 to watch out for sanctions leaks. This group is currently continuing its critical work on sanctions packages against Russia. Last week, Moscow released a report claiming that the country's economy contracted by 1.9% in the first quarter of 2023. Repo shared data confirming this report. In other words, this group continues to watch Russia economically second by second. On the other hand, Western sanctions have now had an unprecedented negative impact on the Russian economy, and Russia is currently facing a staggering $50 billion budget deficit. Economic measures and export bans seem to compel Russia to supply its soldiers with equipment full of household appliances. In addition, U.S. technology exports to Russia have fallen by nearly 70% since Putin's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in late February last year. Russia's crude oil and energy exports were also heavily affected by the sanctions. Russia's state-owned enterprises, banks, and gas and oil industry are all taking a hit. An advisor to President Vladimir Zelensky also noted that Western sanctions have done unprecedented damage to the Russian economy, which is facing a tearful budget deficit. But the Russians have managed to maintain some of their exports. Russia's discounted oil and gas are sold everywhere at very low prices. Russian oil no longer flows directly to Europe but to India, China, and Turkey, which buy it at a very discounted price. Some of the cheaply bought Russian oil is making its way back to Europe, especially as India converts it into fuel and sells it to the EU at a competitive price. But Russia is not making as much profit from this as before. They no longer have access to Russia's capital markets. In two or three years, the Russian oil industry will begin to move away from the global platform, as in Venezuela. The UK, on the other hand, rallies on Shell, BP, and other major international oil companies to support its technologies. Gazprom did not have this technology, but they bought it from the West. And when these things start to deteriorate, you know, Russia will have to cut back on energy production. The Asian market, on the other hand, allowed Moscow to increase oil exports above pre-invasion levels of Ukraine. But that increase was not matched by revenues, which fell 43% year-on-year in March compared to 2022 figures, according to figures released by commodity monitoring Fernkpler. On the other hand, Vlad Vlasic commented on the figures published by Rostat, the official statistical service of the Russian government, showing that gas and oil companies were heavily robbed. Vlad Vlasic stated that after the contraction in the Russian energy sector, estimates show that last year more than 1 million Russian youth left the country. Also, according to Rostat, in 2022, business operating profits fell by 12.6% year-on-year. Energy giant Gazprom reported a massive 72% drop, and Russian state-owned enterprises' earnings fell 52%. Russian banks, whose profits had fallen 90% in 2022, were also feeling distressed, according to Rostat figures. The sanctions left a significant mark on the banks and banking systems in Russia. For example, VDB Group, which includes Russia's second-largest bank, VDB Bank, recorded a loss of 614 billion rubles. Most Russian banks require partners from abroad, such as Iran, to facilitate transactions, a process that increases costs significantly. In addition, the Russian government has introduced legislative changes that restrict banks' ability to transact, especially for military personnel. If the aim is to weaken Russia's financial sector and trigger spillovers into the real economy, for example, through the credit channel, additional sanctions on banks are needed. 
due to the economic devastation caused by the sanctions. It's also reported that Russian airline projects are not in a position to offer to buyers. The head of Ross Trans Nasser, which oversees the Russian transport network, Viktor Basargin, reported at a parliamentary committee meeting that the sanctions mean that essential safety equipment on domestic planes cannot be changed. Several hundred unscheduled inspections of Russian airlines, shortages of components from companies operating Western equipment, and problems in supplying consumables have also exacerbated these issues. In addition, Russia's largest airline, Aeroflot, instructed its staff not to report missing or broken safety equipment, revealing how tragic the situation was. Aeroflot announced in a statement that all spare pots have undergone rigorous entry control in terms of compliance with quality requirements, date of origin, and possession of the necessary certificates. But this statement cannot hide the problems that have occurred in the Russian aviation field. It's thought that ultimately the impact will be felt by Russia on the battlefield, provided the West remains determined. Now that Russia admits it's trying to make up for the resources it can't hold, it doesn't look like it can sustain its current position much longer. It is an obvious fact that the burden on the Russian economy is increasing day by day. But despite the sanctions having a major impact, the Russian government is still able to supply its troops to continue the offensive war in Ukraine. There is a need to tighten sanctions against the Russian defense industry and to implement them effectively with sufficient force. Barmuch remains a priority target for the Russian military. However, the Ukrainian armed forces managed to advance up to 500 meters in various sections and hold the southwestern part of the city. In the past day, Ukrainian armed forces eastern group spokesperson Sarai Sharavati stated that the situation in this direction is very difficult. The Russian army focused its efforts on the battles in the city, but the Ukrainian army controlled the situation and successfully repelled the attacks of the Russian army. Sharavati said, there is a certain element of us taking the initiative from them and counterattacking. Barmuch remains the primary target for the Russian army, and they are conducting all offensive operations there. During the past day, 10 combat engagements have occurred. The Russian army hit our positions 277 times with artillery of different types and calibers and launched nine airstrikes. However, these attacks were unsuccessful. A total of 141 Russian soldiers were killed. 220 Russian soldiers were injured, and one Russian soldier was taken prisoner. In addition, a Russian tank, an IFV, an armored vehicle, three mortars, four Orlan UAVs, a Zala UAV, and three ammunition depots were also destroyed. Ukrainian troops on the flanks continued to advance, putting pressure on the Russian army, especially during daylight hours. Ukrainian troops managed to advance up to 500 meters in different sections. Furthermore, Russian officials denied the reports about Russia's alleged takeover of the city. The Russian press, in particular, is spreading fake news that the army has entered all their territory, allegedly claiming that Bahmut has fallen. These reports are absolutely untrue. As of now, the southwestern part of the city is in the hands of the Russian army. Only Russian defense units are stationed in the aforementioned area and are trying to wage a defensive war there. However, Considering that the ammunition of the Russian army is almost exhausted and the morale of the soldiers is quite low, the efforts of the Russian defense forces will not last long. The Ukrainian war has had many turning points, and the Battle of Bahmut has become one of these turning points. Bahmut, which has become a matter of honor for both warring countries, is especially important for the Russian president. Because of this importance, some Western experts referred to Bahmut as Putin's Stalingrad. So, could Barmut really be Putin's Stalingrad? We can only understand the true turning point in a war when we look back and examine previous similar wars. It is a well-known fact that after the Battle of Gettysburg, the Confederacy was unable to successfully occupy the North during the U.S. Civil War, and the Germans suffered such a huge loss at Stalingrad that they remained largely on the defensive for the remainder of World War II. However, None of these conflicts resulted in the immediate end of the aforementioned wars. While the U.S. Civil War continued for nearly two bloody years, the Soviet Red Army actually suffered just as many casualties after Stalingrad. These facts need to be remembered, as it appears that the Russian army may lose the Battle of Barmut in the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine. This week, it was reported that Kiev forces have made new advances in fierce fighting near Barmut, despite Russia sending new troops including paratroopers. In this case, 
it would not be wrong to say that Bonmut is far from being the Stalingrad of the Ukrainian war. For President Putin, the capture of Barmut may be viewed as symbolic, as a real strategic victory. There were also allegations that Putin hoped to seize full control of Bonmut in time for the Victory Day celebrations that mark the outcome of World War II, which was celebrated last week. However, Moscow had to reduce the number of army personnel at the parade, while other cities canceled events altogether due to safety concerns and lack of equipment. More importantly, fighting continued in Bonmut. Despite Ukrainian officials signaling that their recent advance in Bahamut was not actually part of a larger counteroffensive plan by Kiev to repulse the Russian army, Ukraine claimed to have saved about 7. 70 of land on the outskirts of the city. The area in question is small, but it appears to have been on the defensive, even as Kremlin forces struggled to secure their first significant victory in months of ongoing fighting. So, what is the current status of Bahamut? Satellite photos shared online this week showed the smoldering remains of Barmud, which was once home to more than 70,000 people. As of March this year, the mayor of Barmud claimed that less than 4,000 people remained in the city. According to the mayor, the remaining civilians live in shelters without access to water, gas, or electricity. In these fierce conflicts, almost every building in the city was affected, and entire blocks were razed to the ground. Places that were once apartments, single-family homes, schools, and shops are now little more than rubble and ash. Bonmood has become a gray city, described as a true ghost town, complete with skeletal buildings and barren lands. Spring did not come to Bonmood as the once green pots of the city are now devoid of all vegetation. As the UK Defense Ministry has reported, this has been the scene of some of the bloodiest conflicts and has acquired a special symbolic significance that outweighs its size despite not having any strategic advantage on the battlefield. Moscow has described it as a stepping stone for other cities in the wider Donbass region. However, it may seem like there will be no Kremlin victory, and it could be seen as a significant symbolic victory for Kiev, even though it is unclear if this is a turning point in the war. Time will tell, but for now, time has almost completely stopped in Bahamut in the battle for Bahamut. The Russian army has deployed almost 90% of its forces in Ukraine including Russia's modern BMPD Terminator armored combat vehicle, which is one of the most advanced weapon systems in the arsenal of the Russian army. From the outside, it looks quite intimidating and futuristic. This tank is used in limited numbers on the Ukrainian front and is currently actively used in Bahamut. However, recently the Ukrainians destroyed the most valuable weapon system of the Russian president's army. So, how was this possible? Last February, the Ukrainian army neutralized a BMPD Terminator armored combat vehicle on the Eastern Front. At that time, the Russian army was advancing hard along the Kremenia Svatov contact line. Ukrainian forces were on the outskirts of Kremena and were trying to seize the town. The aim was to liberate Kremena from Russian control, enter Bahamut from behind, and leave the Russian army under double fire. Ukrainian soldiers of the 140th Separate Reconnaissance Battalion managed to neutralize a BMPD Terminator with small arms fire in the woods outside Kremena. Then Ukrainian troops called an artillery fire, which destroyed the incapacitated BMPD Terminator, marking the first known destruction of an advanced weapon system in combat. The operation of the 140th Reconnaissance Battalion proved that this combat vehicle, which is claimed to be invincible and unique, can be destroyed like any other Russian scrap metal. After this offensive operation, Russia has lost 20 of these tanks, including in the Battle of Bahamut. At the start of the war, the Russian Ministry of Defense did not deploy any of its most advanced weapon systems in Ukraine, such as that 14 Armada main battle tank and the fifth-generation Su-57 Felon fighter jet. As the war progressed and the Russian forces began to suffer extremely heavy losses, the Russian Ministry of Defense maintained the same stance and did not deploy its most modern weapon systems on other fronts except Bahamut. Today, despite the extreme shortage of all types of weapons, the Russian military leadership continues to use the most advanced weapon systems in a very limited realm. This is most likely due to the fact that, despite marketing narratives, the most advanced weapon systems have proven not to be as advanced as they are portrayed to the world. In addition, these weapons are not used in the Ukrainian war for fear that their market value will decrease because they will be destroyed if used in a real conflict. In conclusion, the situation in Barmuch remains highly contested, 
with both sides claiming victories and losses. The city has suffered significant damage and loss of life, and its future remains uncertain. The outcome of the war in Ukraine is still unclear, and only time will reveal its true turning points and implications.